of the UK Law Weekly podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week we're going to be looking at the case of JSC BTA Bank and Krapunov, and the citation for this case is 2018 UKSC 19. And the background to this case is fascinating, and relates to what has been described as fraud on an epic scale, but also has political implications that reach to the highest levels of government. BTA Bank is a nationalised bank in Kazakhstan, but before it was brought under state control in 2009, it was chaired and controlled by a gentleman known as Mukhtar Ablayazov. It was claimed that Ablayazov had embezzled around $6 billion into various offshore accounts and shell companies. At that time, the bank also did a lot of work with the Silk Road Group on projects in Georgia, That group has a very dodgy background of financial misconduct and was a client of Mossack Fonseca of Panama Papers fame. In fact, they had even entered into an agreement with the Trump Organization to license the Trump brand for two luxury developments in Georgia. That got cancelled when Trump became president because of a conflict of interest, but it is still subject to the Mueller investigation. If you are interested in finding out more about that aspect, then there was a brilliant article in The New Yorker in August 2017 by Adam Davidson called Trump's Business of Corruption. Back to Ablayazov, and a number of cases were brought against him by BTA Bank in 2009 in the English High Court. The decisions generally went against him, including one handed down by William Blair, the brother of former Prime Minister Tony Blair who later went on to be paid quite handsomely by opponents of Ablayazov in the Kazakh government. Just going to leave that there for you. Anyway, in conjunction with the cases against him, Ablayazov was required by the court to disclose all of his assets, and they were then subject to a worldwide freezing order. The problem was that he didn't disclose all of his assets and tried to put them out of reach via a number of shell companies. He was sentenced to 22 months for contempt of court, but by the time that judgment had been handed down, Ablayazov had already fled the country. Even today, it is not clear where he is hiding out, although he apparently claims to be behind the anti-government protests that took place recently in Kazakhstan. To be honest, it is hard to get a reliable source, and it is possible Ablayazov's name is just being used as an excuse for a government crackdown. In the meantime, only very little of the sum owed from the judgments has actually been received. The present case brought by the bank is against Elias Krapunov, who is the son-in-law of Ablayazov. They are accused of working together to help hide the assets as a result of an agreement the pair came to in England. The claim itself falls under the law of tort, and specifically conspiracy to cause financial loss by unlawful means. When the case came before the Supreme Court, the first point of contention was that the contempt of court was not sufficient to constitute the unlawful means for the purpose of the tort. In other words, Krapunov was arguing that because contempt of court is not by itself the basis for legal action against a person, it also cannot be the basis for the conspiracy to cause loss by unlawful means. This wasn't exactly convincing for the justices because the conspiracy is a tort in its own right, and so it cannot necessarily be dependent on the availability of a completely separate cause of action. Instead, the best way to think about the tort is to break it down into its three component parts, conspiracy, causing loss, and unlawful means. The first bit, conspiracy, is easy because it just refers to the agreement between Ablayazov and Krapunov. The causing of loss is a little bit more difficult because this must be a deliberate action. In other words, while the main purpose of the agreement was hiding the wealth, part of the reasoning has to be causing loss to the bank. For the Supreme Court, this was deliberate and went beyond being a merely incidental factor. Finally, in respect of the unlawful means, we have already hinted that contempt of court is available as an option, despite not being a cause of action itself. The justices expanded on this by noting the rather obvious point that there is an obligation to follow the law. Contempt of court is a criminal offence and therefore represents unlawful means. With all three elements established, that should have been the end of the case, but there was a further argument advanced by Krapunov relating to the jurisdiction of the English courts. In particular, Krapunov lives in Switzerland, and according to Article 2 of the Lugano Convention, 
a person should be sued in the state where they are domiciled. There is, however, an exception to this in Article 5.3 that allows a claim in tort to be brought, quote, where the harmful event occurred or may occur, end quote. The question for the Supreme Court then is, did the harmful event take place in the UK? When trying to answer this question, the main problem is that the agreement was an ongoing one between the parties in both the UK and Switzerland. Fortunately, an answer is available by referring to other similar international agreements, such as the Brussels Regulation within the EU, and the Court of Justice has allowed for an interpretation that covers both where the damage occurred as well as the place that originally gave rise to the damage. It is this second point that is relevant here, and the emphasis from the Court of Justice has been on the formation of an agreement as opposed to its implementation, as seen in the case of Cartel Damage Claims Hydrogen Peroxide and ASCO Noble Envy from 2015. In this case, the agreement was formed in the UK, and so Krapunov's appeal could be dismissed in its entirety. The final analysis of this case does not need to be overly burdensome. The interpretation of unlawful means to include a criminal offence is hardly controversial, and while drawing on the Brussels Convention and the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of the European Union to interpret an agreement with Switzerland is a little bit of a stretch. The conclusion that a tortious event can be held to have taken place where it originated is both a sensible and practical approach. The case does however present an opportunity to talk about the large number of actions brought by Eastern European and Russian litigants in the English courts. In the past year, 31 cases involved Kazakh litigants and 20 involved Russians out of a total of 158 cases. The Kazakh figure is most likely inflated by the extensive BTA bank litigation that we caught a glimpse of today, but that is no excuse for ignoring this wider trend that has long been prevalent in commercial law. To be honest, there are not many disadvantages to this though. Arguments that this clogs up the legal system are not made out as the majority of litigants are British, and while there are certain inefficiencies, the reforms of the past 10 or 20 years have improved the pace with which cases are dealt with. Of course, it isn't always pleasant to have cases involving fraud, corruption and conspiracy, among other things, dragged through the English courts, but that is not much different to turning up at a magistrate's court on any given weekday and seeing what goes on there. Any fear that the corruption will infiltrate the UK as a result of this ignores the fact that the reason England is chosen is precisely because of the low levels of corruption. We do have to concede that there might be political ramifications, as for example when Ablyazov was granted asylum, Kazakhstan threatened to send a number of lucrative contracts China's way instead. But in many ways this is just the game that you play when dealing with autocrats. The number of foreign cases is therefore to be welcomed, but as we move forward there are a couple of points of concern. Firstly, while this brings a lot of money into the commercial legal sector, we don't see this filter down into other areas. It is strange to think that at a time when there has never been more money flowing into the legal sector, we are undergoing a crisis in legal aid. I'm not trying to make a point here that commercial lawyers should do more pro bono work or that big firms should pay more tax, it is just interesting to note the widening disparity within the profession. Finally, there is a question about how sustainable this trend is. Some people have suggested that Brexit will have an impact on the number of cases coming to the UK, but I'm not convinced by that. After all, Kazakhstan is not in the EU, and it's not likely the entire infrastructure of law and justice is going to break down after we leave. Nevertheless, there are rivals for this business that the UK attracts. Within Europe, a lot of similar cases are going to other countries with a comparable legal tradition, for example Sweden. Perhaps the biggest threat though comes from outside of Europe, as places like Dubai and Singapore are making concerted efforts to attract business their way. There are a lot of incentives on offer, and this is having an effect, but their comparatively lower rankings on the democracy index means that there is less certainty and finality in the judgments that are handed down compared to in England, where the rule of law has stood firm for centuries. 
Well, thank you very much for tuning into this episode and thanks as ever to bensound.com who provides the theme music. Just a quick reminder from me that if you are interested in a free guide to answering problem questions, this is especially designed for law students, then you can sign up for my email list at uklawweekly.com and you will get that free in your inbox as well as regular emails from me about um, news stories from the legal sector. I'll be back next week with another case, but in the meantime, bye!